greet you again today in that lovely name, above all names, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Appreciating your presence here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. We thank God for the beautiful sunshine after much rain. And we appreciate you and the radio listening audience tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to every one of you. And if you call a friend and have them to tune in, you'll be doing them a favor and us as well. And we appreciate it very much. Now this, today's tape will be tape number 270. Tape number 270. This will be our ninth tape on the book of Ruth. Tape number nine on the book of Ruth. So you turn to Ruth chapter three, will you please? As we continue on in our preaching from the book of Ruth. Glad to see my good friend Paul Strickland and his wife friend with us back there again today. I'm telling you what the truth. I went over to his place of business the other day and got hope some of them good chitlins over there. And I like to hurt myself. Now, you're talking about good chitlins now. This, oh, this, oh, old country boys like me, they like them things. We don't believe in throwing away any part of the hog. And they can really fix them up because they have some good old Madison County cooks over there that know what they're doing. And also out here on Broad Street as well. I don't know, but they may have these ads in the city slickers out there, but it's still good. But I'm talking about them old country cooks over there at Danielsville. Paul, when are you going to have some more chitlins? Wednesday night. If it's not raining, I'll be there. If it is raining, I'll be there. <laughs> and so uh, we're looking forward to it if we don't get sidetracked some way. I'll tell you, man, I can't miss that because one of these days, they usually cut them off when that spring comes along, waste the fall, and I don't want to miss out on any more of them. All right, turn with you, please, to... Ruth chapter 3, and let's begin reading with verse 8. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. Thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people dost know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tear this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform upon thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it be not known that a woman came into this floor. He also said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. But he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou knowest how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he has finished the thing this day. Now we left off last Sunday morning, if you recall, talking about how that Ruth had gone into the thrashing floor, and there she lay down at the feet of Boaz. Now Boaz is the type of Jesus Ruth is a type of the church. Naomi is a type of Israel. Now we find her at, at Boaz's feet. Now we find the apostle Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel and became a great student. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus 
and became a great saint. Ruth sat at the feet or lay at the feet of Boaz and became a great savior. That is, through her came the Lord Jesus Christ later on in years through this union. Now Boaz turns, and lo and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Now she had slipped into the thrashing floor after they finished thrashing their grain, as she eased in and just lay right down at his feet. Nothing immoral about this. This was a custom well acquainted with in those days because it had a future to it. He was the near kinsman to Naomi, and Naomi knew what she was doing, and she was advising Ruth on what to do. And so she went in and lay at his feet. And the Bible said, and at midnight, uh, she was afraid, and he was afraid, and turned himself, and a woman lay at his feet. Now notice this happened at midnight. Now the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 25 that the five wise and five virgins went into the wedding at midnight. Behold, at midnight the cry went out, the bridegroom cometh. Now here we find that Ruth is a type of the church, Boaz a type of the bridegroom, and this is taking place at midnight. Now she goes in, she's there at midnight, and while she's resting at the feet of Boaz at midnight, Naomi, her mother, waiting while Ruth is at the feet of Boaz, is a type of Israel during the tribulation period that will be on the earth while the church, while the Ruth is yonder in heaven at the feet of Boaz or at the judgment seat of Christ. Now you keep that beautiful type in mind and that will help you. This happened at midnight. She lay down at his feet. This is where the church was set, what it gets its full salvation. We don't have our full salvation now. Our souls are saved, but our bodies are not glorified. We will receive our full salvation at the feet of Jesus, at the BMR seat of Christ, while the tribulation period is running its course upon the earth. We'll be there to get our glorified bodies and rewards according to the Bible. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, we find there that the Lord Jesus Christ shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the catching us out at the feet of Jesus. Ruth here at the feet of Boaz after the thrashing is over. She's at the feet of Boaz and we'll be there at the judgment seat of Christ during the thrashing time on the earth. In the Songs of Solomon chapter 2 verses 16 and 17, he said, My beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies until the daybreak and the shadows flee away. My beloved be like a roe or a young heart up on the mountains of Bethar. And here he's talking about another type God is in the Bible, the type of the church and Jesus Christ. Now Boaz lay there beside his grain to protect it, and Ruth. Now he's protecting the grain, but what he finds is a woman laying at his feet. He's protecting her as well. Now she's a type of a new convert. She's a type of all true born-again believers. And Boaz, a type of Jesus. And God has promised in the Bible that he will protect his own. You don't have to worry about the devil killing you. He can't kill you unless God permits it. You need not worry about certain things happening to you. It won't happen unless God really permits it to happen. Because God has promised to protect you. And he will protect you. As long as you live upon the earth. So we see here Boaz is protecting not only his grain. But he is protecting this woman he's to marry. Now of course when she marries Boaz. As we see later on. Not today of course. But uh, possibly next Sunday or so. And when he marries. When she marries Boaz. Then this grain. Everything that belongs to Boaz. All of his wealth will partly belong to her as well. According to the Bible, a man and his wife is one. Really what belongs to one belongs to the other, according to the word of God. 
And so when she marries him, all the grain that's been protected will also belong to her as well. And the Bible tells us we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed the last time, and our inheritance are also kept in heaven for us. The same God that's keeping us is keeping our inheritance in heaven. We are as of God and joined as with Jesus Christ, and we're going to enter into everything that he owns in that day. And all rewards that you've laid up in heaven, every dime you've given for the cause of God, even to drink of cold water in the name of the disciple, God has a record and God is keeping that to reward you for yonder in heaven. God knows everything you do, every effort you put forth, every sacrifice you make, every time you are so tired you can hardly make it to the house of God, but you come on anyway. God knows about these things. God doesn't overlook one thing you do for Him. Not only that, God doesn't overlook what you could do and you don't do. On Wednesday nights when you're sitting at home and your pastor is trying to teach the Word of God and we're trying to have prayer at the church, and you're sitting at home, you think God's asleep and doesn't know that? Sure God knows that. He knows where you ought to be. And that's displeasing to the Lord. He's not a bit pleased about that. And God may eventually have to deal with you about it. Every person that belongs to a local church, unless they're providentially hindered, they absolutely can't make it, ought to find themselves in the church where they're part of on Wednesday nights for Bible study and prayer meeting. That's part of the church's work. And when you're not there, if you don't have a good excuse that God would accept, and it better be one God will accept, then God will hold you accountable. And then if the church eventually has to close its doors on Wednesday nights, like a lot of them's already done, who's God going to hold responsible? The church members that could have come and did not come. They'll have to ask their God for the closing of the church doors on Wednesday nights. And you'd be surprised at the church doors that's now closed on Wednesday nights and also on Sunday nights. Who's going to be responsible? The church members that could have been there and didn't come. God's going to hold them responsible. And every sinner that dies and goes to hell because of it, they're going to be held responsible. See, this is serious business in which we're dealing with today. We better realize that. And so she lay there to be protected. And Boaz inquired, Who art thou? In verse 9. He said to Ruth, Who art thou? This woman lying at his feet, Who art thou? Now the Bible said he threw his robe over her. Let me give you a verse of scripture in the Old Testament where God threw his robe over uh, the Israel. It's found in the uh, book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 8. Look at this. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was a time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. In other words, God saw Israel. Israel had gone astray and become a, a, a Jehovah's adulterous wife. And she'd gone astray and living in weakness and sin. God saw her as needing to be covered up. And, and God spread his, his robe over her and said, You're mine and I love you in spite of all the things that you have done. I love you still. Israel was God's adulterous wife. And God loved her in spite of that. And wanted to take her back. We find in the, in the book of Hosea. The Hosea had a wife. That went astray and went out. And played the part of a harlot. And became so low until they put her on the auction block. And auctioned her off as a harlot. And as a slave. And we find that Hosea went to the auction block. To buy her back. He said she's my wife. And I love her. In spite of all the bad things she's done. She's mine. And I want to take her back into my bosom. And I want her to do that which is right. And that was a type of God taking Israel back when Israel had made its mistakes. And God loves his children. Sometimes they make mistakes. And God forgives them. We should forgive one another and accept each other in the way of forgiveness. That's God's way. God doesn't bring up against you things that you did back yonder before you were saved. God cleanses you and forgave you and pardoned you. And then uh, when you make your mistakes after you're saved, 
You ask God to forgive you and mean business, and God will forgive you and help you as you sojourn. And he said, Who art thou? 9 verse 9. The answer is, she did not say, I am Ruth the Moabitess. She didn't say that. She didn't, nor did she say, I am Ruth the stranger, as she was called at one time. She, she did not say, I am Ruth the damsel, as she is referred to at one time. But what did she say? She said, I am Ruth the hand, thy handmaid. In the other words, I'm the handmaid, the servant, uh, just to do whatever the master wants me to do. The Bible says over in the book of Acts chapter 2, in the latter days, he said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 18, I'll pour out my spirits upon my servants and my handmaidens in those days, and they shall prophesy. And she said, I'm thine handmaid. If I belong to you, I'm at your service. If I belong to you, I'm yours. I want to do what you would have me to do. Now when Jacob was wrestling with God and asking for the blessing, he was asked, what is thy name? The angel said, oh man, what's your name? You've been wrestling here with me all night. What is your name? He said, my name is Jacob, meaning a uh, supplanter, a, a schemer, a crooked. And my name is Jacob. He said, from here on, your name will be Israel. And God changed his name. God can change our ways. And God can look at us in a different manner if we mean business and move on for God. She reminded him that he was her near kinsman. She said, you are my near kinsman. Now, what is meant by that? In Old Testament days, when people lost their property and had to leave it, then, of course, they couldn't get that property back until the 50th year. On the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. Every man could redeem his property back there on the 50th year, the year of Jubilee. But if someone came along during that time, any time between year 1 and year 50, and was the near kin to that individual, and was willing to do it, and had the money to do it, he could turn around and buy that property back and give it back to the person to whom it belonged. Now that's the picture here. We find Elimelech and Naomi had left their land, their God-given land, and gone down into Moab. And they'd been down there about nine or ten years, which means a, a, a testimony or a judgment. And they were down there about nine or ten years, and they came back. Now it'd be 40 years. It'd be 40 years before Naomi could claim the land that she and her husband owned before they left that beautiful land. Well, here's a man here that's a near kinsman. He's wealthy. He's got plenty of money. And he could buy that land back if he wanted to. And he could marry Ruth if he wanted to because he was a near kinsman. All he'd have to do is call the men at the gate and say, Fellas, let's transact some business here. I want to buy back the land that belongs to Elimelech and Naomi. And I got the money right here. No doubt they'd say, well, let's check the record here. How long has this land been pawned? Oh, they say 10 years. All right. He says 40 years. Are you willing to pay the price for 40 years and give them the land back? If he said yes, and he was a near kinsman, no one any nearer than he that wanted to do it, and he had the money and he was willing, all he had to do was pull out the money and pay the price and the land would once again belong to Naomi. And he could do that. And so we find here that Ruth is telling him, you are one of our near kinsmen. Now what does she have in mind? Naomi had already told him, that rich man in, in whose field you've been laboring out there, he's a rich man, and he's our near kin. And if he will, he could buy back the land we lost, and we'd have some property and we could live on that property and the land would be ours once again. We loved our little farm before we left it. And he's well able to go and buy it back. And so she reminded him, you are a near kinsman. Now she reminded him of that. God doesn't care if you remind him of things he promised you in the Bible. Or things that, that could be yours, available to you that God promised in this book. It pleases the Lord for you to remind him of things that you want him to do for you, and he will. Let's move on to another thought. Let's Boaz recognize her love for him. In verse 10, 
And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. Now notice what he's calling her now. He's not saying to her, Are you a Moabitess girl? You damsel? Are you, you, you are my daughter, he's saying. He called her his daughter. Blessed art thou, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. Inasmuch as thou fallest not young men, whether poor or rich. Now what is Boaz saying to this beautiful young widow woman here by the name of Ruth? He's saying to her, you did not look at my age. You were not concerned about my age. You didn't care whether I was young or whether I was old. And that proved that you love me. These matter did not stand between us. Now whether young or old, rich or poor, you didn't ask any questions as to whether or not I was a rich man or I was a poor man. But you love me. And that's the thing that counted. Not the matter of wealth, not the matter of poverty, not the matter of age, not the matter of um, youth, but it was the love there that really counted. And she, he recognized that she loved him. Boaz recognized that this beautiful maiden he had seen out in the field gleaning in his field, beautiful girl from down in Moab, and she was so beautiful, and he loved her, he liked her, and now he finds out that she loves him. And that stirs his heart. And whenever he realized she didn't consider whether he was old or whether he was young, whether he was rich or whether he was poor, when he found out that she loved him in spite of these things, then it thrilled his heart. And he made her a great promise. You know, God loves you whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're rich or whether you're poor. God doesn't look at your age or your youth or your wealth or your poverty to determine his love toward you. God loves you. Maybe I'm speaking to someone today. Your hair's white. You've seen the frost of a mini of a winter. Your footsteps begin to get a little slow. When you try to turn the Bible leaves in your Bible, you can hardly separate them anymore because your hands quiver. Maybe your voices begin to crack a little and quiver. And the devil tells you you're getting old now. And the first thing you know, they're going to be singing to you, get away, old man, get away. They don't want you around anymore. And the devil tells you that. But God still loves you. I don't care how old you are. If you are God's child, he loves you. If you are 90, he loves you. If you're seven, he loves you. And God will love you all of your days on the earth. You need to realize that. And he made a great promise. He said, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. Now, what did she require? What must he do? He must get himself lined up to buy back the land that they had lost. Not only that, but he must be willing to marry this beautiful woman that came out of the land of Moab, the, one of the, the, the wife of one of the sons of Elimelech and Naomi. They had discussed it. They talked that over. And she told him all about everything. And she reminded him that he was a man that could do that. He was a man that could buy it back. He had the wealth. And she reminded him that he was a near kinsman and he had to be and she reminded him that he had to be willing and he says I'm willing I will do all that thou requires and so she reminded him of that he said yes I will do that he had in mind of marrying her but you know it came to their minds all of a sudden that there's another fellow that's closer to kin to them than he was Man, that threw a monkey wrench in the machine. Something had to be done about that. Here's another fella that would come before Boaz. And that had to be dealt with. Now we're going to find out one of these Sunday mornings who that man was and why it had to be dealt with and how it actually worked out. Now they found he was, let me let you in on just a little, uh, a little uh, brief thought on that today. You'll be thinking about it. See the apostle Paul got saved and he was shouting the victory he was praising God and he was rejoicing but in Romans chapter 7 he found out he had some company and that company was the old Adamic nature that was standing right there in the way 
He wanted to shout all the time. He wanted to live on the mountaintop. He didn't want to go down in the valley. But he found out he had to do that. And so when you find out that you've got some company and that company remains with you and you have to put up a battle and bring them under subjection every day of your life, you're going to see this thing a little different. And so there came that thought. Now let's look at this thought. She was measured six measures of body, verse 15. She removed her veil and received the barley. The, the, the barley. Now she had a veil over her face. Women in those days wore veils over their faces. And now it was a very serious matter for a woman to remove that veil. She had to know pretty well sure that she was engaged to this man. He's going to marry her. And so she takes a veil off. And when she takes that veil off, he measures her some grain. He gave her six measures of barley. He did not want her to go back empty. And number six is one short of perfection. She gets six measures now. She get measure number seven at the wedding. And so he gave her six measures of barley, which is the number of man. And you can lay at Jesus' feet all night like she lay at the feet of Boaz, and you won't go home empty either. I guarantee you that. She went in. She was empty. She was afraid. She was trembling. She eased it. She lay at Boaz's feet all night long. He's a type of Jesus. But when she laid his feet all night long, the morning just before daylight, he said, don't let anyone know that you come, a woman come into this place. And he said, let's put some barley in your, in your veil. And she took her veil and she went back to Naomi with six measures of barley. Now, beloved, she lay at Jesus' feet, or Boaz's feet, all night, and she went back with an armful. Now, you can lay at Jesus' feet all night, and you can get up the next day with an armful. God will most certainly come to your rescue. If you have a matter in mind that you need to pray about all night, you will leave there empty if you'll pray all night and lay at Jesus' feet all night. Not many people do that anymore. Old timers used to do that. When they had problems to come along, it meant nothing to them to lay all night on their face before God. But when they did, they didn't get up empty the next morning. God came to rescue. They got their six measures of barley. God saw to it. They got that. Now, of course, we see here that the number seven is the number of perfection and completeness that will be completed at the wedding. Now, he would not let her go empty. He said, no, you cannot go empty. And we find here that Ruth here is planning for a wedding. She is planning now to get married to Boaz. And since she's planning to get married, what time is it that she's doing that? Is it midday? No. Early in the morning? No. Uh, it's just midnight and after. During the night of darkness, she is planning for the wedding. And that's exactly what's happening right now. The Holy Spirit of God, right down near the midnight of time, that's where we are now, in this night of time, the Holy Spirit of God is planning for a wedding. He's getting God's people ready for a wedding. You're part of the bride of Christ to be. And during this night time of evil, in these last days, Almost now at the midnight hour, the Holy Spirit is planning for the wedding. He's working on you, and he's working on me. He's getting us ready for the wedding. Now what happened? When she arrived home, her mother-in-law wanted to know who she was, verse 16. That was a good question. I want to know who you are. Are you yet, Miss Ruth, are you going to be Mrs. Boaz? I want you to tell me something, daughter-in-law, dear. Who are you now? Are you Miss Ruth? Are you going to be Mrs. Boaz? She wanted to know. This mother-in-law was a little bit nosy. Usually mother-in-laws are, you know. Don't tell them I said so. I don't want that to get out. But many mother-in-laws get nosy sometimes about their daughters and their sons and so forth, about how they're making it and, and their wedding, you know, and their 
uh, housekeeping, all that bit. They get a little nosy sometimes, but don't you tell any mother-in-laws I said that. I, I, I don't want to get in trouble. If that gets out on me, uh, that somebody might not like it. So you just keep it to yourself. Now, I, I, I know you can keep a secret. I know that. But the people you tell it to, they can't. So that's why I want you to be sure and keep it to yourself that I said that. All right. She said, who art thou? Now notice, the Jew is now waiting to know more about the church and we want to know more after the rapture. Like Naomi staying there in darkness, waiting for Ruth to come in. When the church is gone, he's going to miss something. He's going to realize something has happened religiously. He's going to realize that the people that knew Christ has gone. And that Jew is going to nose around like Naomi did to find out what happened to Ruth. What, what, what happened to the Christians? All these Jews that go wild try to find out what happened to the church, what happened to Christians. Now Ruth was told to sit still in verse 18. Uh, she said, you sit still. Now her mother-in-law was a wise old woman. And uh, she said now to her daughter-in-law, you just sit still, keep your mouth shut, be much in prayer, and wait. Whatever that man told you, he'll do it. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to go and confer with anyone or counsel with anyone about it. What he told you, he will do. Now, daughter, sit still. One of the hardest things in the world to do is sit still when you don't get something done right quick, but when you need to be waiting on God. Learn to sit still and wait on God. And when you know you wait on the Lord, the Lord's going to do something about it. The man Boaz would finish the work, she said in verse 18. This man will not rest until he has done this thing today. You can trust him. He's a type of Christ. He'll do exactly what he said he would do. You just wait. And everything God promised you to do, he will do. You just wait. Don't get in too big a hurry. Hold your horse a minute. He'll take care of the situation. Just wait on God. He'll take care of it. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, He which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Did you get that? He that's begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is working on you and God is molding you and making you. And God will continue to work on you and mold you and make you until he calls you home. He'll never stop until the day of Jesus Christ. Naomi said to Ruth, wait. He'll do what he said he would do. Let's stand up feet. Dear Father in heaven, I pray today that you take the message and use it. Thank you for our greater Boaz, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for Ruth, the church. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful word. A lamp on thy feet, a light on thy path. Thank you, our Father. Use it for Christ's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. While David plays a stanza of some number, listen to me. I may let you go in a moment. If you're in this building and you're not saved and you want to get saved, if you'll come down here, we'll help you to God. If you're in this building and you once knew the Lord and you've broken that fellowship and, and you're not happy and you want to come back and renew that fellowship with God, you come down here, we'll pray with you. Number three, if you're in this building and you want to join Northside Baptist Church as we receive members and let this church be your home church, you come on down and we'll take over. Number four, if any reason you want to come to have a mission, I want you to feel free to come while she plays through the stanza. Come on, if God is speaking. 